Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another joint EOL RAL seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Heis DeBoer, who is a research scientist at Ceres in Colorado University and at NOAA's Physical Sciences Lab here in Boulder. Heis is well known in the Atmospheric Science Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he received both his master's and PhD. Currently at Colorado University, Dr. DeBoer is the chief scientist of the Integrated Remote and In-Situ Sensing Group, where his research focus is in the high latitude environments, studying applications of unmanned aircraft systems for atmospheric research, aerosol cloud interactions in, cloud, in Arctic clouds, and process studies in Arctic cloud formation and life cycle. With his interest in, Arctic, in the Arctic atmosphere, it is no surprise that Heiss is on the International Arctic Science Committee as our National Academies of Sciences US delegate, among other committees that focus on atmospheric science in the high latitude environment. His latest paper was published in the Bulletin of American Meteorological Society on the capabilities and development of unmanned aircraft to study the atmosphere. And this leads us to his seminar. Topic entitled Robotic Revolution, Recent Work in Earth System Observing with Remotely Piloted Aircraft. We are using Slido to pose questions, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. The Slido window is located below this presentation screen. Do not panic. If you do not see your question pop up, we are archiving all questions until the end of the speaker's presentation where they will be revealed during the Q&A portion of the talk. Dr. Heis DeVoer, we welcome you to EOL and RAL, and the virtual stage is now yours. Great, thank you. Um, I'm muting and starting video here. Thanks very much for the wonderful uh, introduction, Jackie. I appreciate that. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, it's really great to be able to present to uh, the NCAR community, and um, it's unfortunate. Of course, we can't do it in person, but I'm happy to happy and excited to share some of our recent work. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I, I wear a lot of different hats, um, primarily at the University of Colorado. Um, I will say quickly, one hat that I wear that wasn't mentioned, uh, but is represented in the bottom right there is that I'm uh, founder of a small consulting firm called Boreas Consulting. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because one of the companies that I've worked with in that capacity is Black Swift Technologies, uh, who are here in Boulder. And um, you'll see their name in the presentation. I think I provide that information in an unbiased way, but just from the perspective of full disclosure, I wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of the work that I've done with them in the past. So to get started here, um, I wanted to start with just a little bit of background on my uh, research history, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I've been focused on high latitude environments for quite some time now, since my time in graduate school. And um, one of the things that I spent a lot of time trying to understand was the, the kind of dynamics and physics of mixed phase stratiform clouds in high latitude environments. And it was about 10 years ago that I was working with colleagues at NCAR and NOAA and elsewhere um, to develop a review paper for Nature Geoscience that talked about the really complex web of interactions that come together to support the life cycle of these types of clouds. And in the process, you know, we were developing these nice, nice figures like the one that's on the screen here um, and, and really trying to document our state of knowledge and the, the things that we knew and we didn't know. And in doing so, it became really clear to me um, that we didn't necessarily have all of the perspectives that we needed to fully address the questions we might have about the, these clouds and, and what makes them tick. And so um, looking at some of the you know, really important processes and, and physics of the situation, thinking about um, the, the thermodynamic structure of the lower atmosphere and its evolution, um, which you know, we were used to having radiosons every six or 12 hours if we were lucky uh, and trying to guess at what was going on in between. Um, things like the, the, the dynamics of the cloud and the turbulence that's generated by the cloud layer, uh, where we had some limited remotely sensed measurements, but not nearly enough to really close in all the gaps. Um, information on the precipitation, 
the radiation and the, the radio structure of the clouds, um, the spatial variability of the near surface, you know, turbulent fluxes uh, and other terms of the surface energy budget like albedo, for example. And uh, perhaps one of the more important ones is the vertical structure of aerosol particles that can impact the microphysics of these clouds. And so it was in that, that thinking state that I started to stumble upon other ways in which we might observe the atmosphere. And while I don't remember exactly um, all of the steps that led to this, I think one day I was thinking about you know, how cool it would be if we could just instrument some birds that were up there anyway, um, because some of the other assets that we had available to us, like large uh, research aircraft, just weren't necessarily practical, both from a cost perspective, as well as from the perspective of um, flying in what could be a, a fairly dangerous environment in, in icing conditions at low altitude. And, and that's kind of where my, my thinking started moving towards um, drones or uncrewed aircraft systems, which is what the rest of this presentation will be about. Um, just to start with a bit of a definition here, um, you know, when, when you say the word drones, a lot of different people have different thoughts on what that means. And I'm sure even in this audience, you know, people have a, a pretty good perspective on the sorts of platforms we might be talking about, but th there's a huge range of different platforms. And you see in the top image there, um, that's me, all, all six foot four of me in front of the NASA Global Hawk, uh, which is a, a very large aircraft, one that um, NCAR is quite familiar with due to instrumentation that's been developed for that platform. Um, that's, that's an aircraft, of course, that's kind of on one extreme on the high altitude, long endurance side of things. Um, not necessarily the best platform for detailed studies of the boundary layer. And on the other end, we have these kind of consumer drones that are commonly available. I'm guessing some of you have these types of systems that are quite light and small and compact and easy to fly, like the, the DJI system that's in the bottom picture there. Um, those also have their place, but um, not necessarily exactly what we're looking for uh, with respect to being able to instrument them with a variety of different sensors and, and types of packages to help us understand the atmosphere. And so the, the presentation here focuses on what are called small UAS. Um, these are typically on the scale of, you know, a half meter to a couple meters in size, um, both including fixed swing and, and multi-rotor platforms and are by definition in the weight class between about 0.55 and 55 pounds. Um, so that's, that's really going to be the focus of what I'm talking about today is that scale of platform. And those platforms have some very distinct advantages. Um, for example, they have a very small operational footprint. Um, this is a video of us launching one of our Raven systems off of a beach in, in Barbados because we were there to study clouds. I'll talk more about that later. Um, but you can see that it doesn't take much space or many people to operate these aircraft. Um, I'll let that video go one more time. You can see here we're using a bungee launcher um, and a tent to house our, our laptop and equipment. Um, that makes them easy to deploy in a variety of areas. It makes them quite transportable. It also means that they're relatively inexpensive to operate and what relatively inexpensive means is different to different people as well. But um, I would argue that for the amount of data that you can collect with one of these systems, the time in the field is, is relatively inexpensive. Um, they're also highly portable. I mentioned that earlier. Here's an example of us launching one of these systems off the top of uh, the tracker vehicles that IRIS has for specifically this, this purpose. Um, they're also great outreach tools. And you can see uh, the guy giving the thumbs up there with the beer shirt on. I should tell him not to wear that next time. He's an undergraduate student um, that was uh, deployed with us at this particular campaign. Um, these platforms are really great for engaging students, for engaging early career scientists, and for engaging the general public. Uh, they, they tend to um, captivate people's imagination and provide pathways for discussions on what it is we're doing. Um, in addition to those things, these platforms are also nice from the perspective that they're relatively slow flying. And this is onboard camera from a Raven flying over coastal Wisconsin. Um, we operate this platform between approximately 15 to 20 meters per second, um, sometimes a little faster if there's high wind environments. Um, and some people might see that as a disadvantage but quite frankly, uh, for us, it provides us an opportunity to get much higher resolution measurements of the phenomena of interest. And so when you're flying at this sort of a velocity with uh, sensors that have a high response time, 
you get down to centimeter scales, uh, which can be really nice and something that's really difficult to achieve through other means. And then finally, the thing I'll say about um, these types of platforms, I mentioned earlier that um, we didn't necessarily like to fly people into some types of environments. This is video of uh, one of the other Iris aircraft flying in severe weather in the Midwest, um, trying to understand the dynamics of the rear flank of the supercell. And you know, clearly, uh, there are places where we don't want to put people's lives at risk. That, that would be most places. Uh, or any places. And so the, these types of platforms um, can be operated safely in high risk environments uh, with some planning. And so they offer opportunities to make measurements in places where we otherwise wouldn't necessarily be able to send airborne platforms for in-situ sensing. I wish I could tell you that I was the first person to think of all this. Um, clearly I wasn't. There were many people before me that started to leverage small UAS for atmospheric research. And I just have a few examples here on the screen. I, as an aside, I'll say I'm happy to um, have all these pictures be black and white because it makes it look really old. Uh, but you know, some of this stuff wasn't too long ago in the 80s and 90s uh, where people started leveraging these types of platforms and instrumenting them to understand things like thermodynamic structure and turbulence in the lower atmosphere. Um, having said that, we are in the process of what I, consider to be um, a bit of a revolution. I think it's the golden age of miniaturization. We have you know, computers in our pockets with our cell phones. We have sensors. I'm wearing a watch right now that can tell me everything I want to know about how well my run went uh, earlier today. So we have a lot of technological advancement that is pushing us in the direction of um, greater capabilities with small things. And so we stand to benefit from that from the perspective of small UAS because People have been working hard to develop new sensor systems, um, new autopilot systems, new communication systems, et cetera, and that all can be leveraged for this type of research. And so with this backdrop, I was fortunate in that when I started my position here at the University of Colorado uh, about 10 years ago, um, the timing was right, I would say, to, to jump into some of this type of research. And the environment was great as well. And um, I, I would be doing a lot of people a disservice if I didn't recognize the fact that the work that I'm going to show in the rest of this presentation is the result of collaborations with a wide variety of people. Um, the Boulder contingent of which is kind of pictured here. You, you probably see some familiar faces from, from NCARB as well as from other areas. Um, and, you know, we've had support from a variety of funding agencies and institutions to help develop some of these tools and techniques. And, you um, I think we're just scratching the surface. There's a lot more that can be done there. So jumping into the, the early campaigns, um, I think I was excited. You know, I had an Arctic research background and I decided that the best place to start doing this would be in the Arctic. And there were, there were reasons to think that would be true. Um, one is that the Department of Energy had just stood up a new observational site at a place called Elliptic Point on the North Slope of Alaska, a little bit west or east, excuse me, of uh, which is formerly known as Barrow. Um, Elliptic Point has with it restricted airspace, uh, both directly over the site and a warning area that extends far offshore. And so from the perspective of you know, regulations and interactions with the FAA, this was very easy. Of course, that comes along with interacting with DOE to demonstrate all the safety issues there. But um, we, we took our platforms uh, as part of a campaign called Erasmus. That was kind of the first proposed campaign um, to the North Slope uh, in 2015 and um, learned a lot, frankly. We, we did a lot of flying. You can see the statistics on flight hours and number of flights on the right-hand side there. Um, our flights ranged between April and October, typically. Um, we didn't really fly in the winter season in the dark, but um, learned a lot about flying in harsh environments, about icing, about operating near bears, um, working in the vicinity of a strong Air Force radar, a lot of lessons learned. From a scientific perspective, you see the three questions in the bottom right here um, with respect to low level temperature and moisture structure and their relationship to clouds, um, the vertical structure of aerosol properties and uh, the performance of our remote sensing retrievals. Those are the things that we propose to go after. And it would, I think this work was successful in the, in the sense that it did address some of these questions. Um, it also helped to facilitate the re 
uh, adoption of this sort of technology within the Department of Energy's ARM program. And um, that, that continues today, although maybe not in the same form that we introduced it. So just a few examples of the sorts of measurements we were making, you know, thinking specifically about the Arctic uh, boundary layer structure or lower atmospheric structure. Here's a nice example of a, a crisp, clear October day, right as the sea ice is starting to freeze up. You can see in the top left, uh, this is an image from aboard the Data Hawk as we were flying over the runway at Lake Tuck Point. Um, we had a very strong near surface temperature inversion. And just as an introduction to the Data Hawk itself, the picture on the top right shows the platform and uh, the sensors that we carry on board. Uh, this includes uh, an autopilot system developed at the University of Colorado, along with a fine wire array that was developed at CU, um, and then some sensors to sense pressure, temperature, humidity. In this case, it's a Vaisla sensor. It hasn't always been a Vaisla sensor. Uh, we've also flown sensors from IMEC and other uh, companies. But for this particular day, the bottom figure shows the, the sampling that we were doing. And you can see we were very focused on the layer between about, let's call it 30 and 150 meters or 200 meters, where we saw these really strong temperature inversions in place. Um, we did also conduct a couple of low altitude flights. You can see here and here, assuming you can see my mouse just after nine and right around midnight. Um, those were ge geared at looking at near surface fluxes. So we we're flying at 20 meters in this case, right over the sea ice. Um, from an evolution perspective, the next day was quite different. We had low cloud cover and you can see the thermodynamic structure evolved quite dramatically. Um, we had now a warming surface or a warm surface from the presence of the cloud uh, and additional wind, which created a shear driven mixed layer near the surface. And we had a cloud driven mixed layer aloft with the remnants of that inversion here. And so this is the sort of documentation that we were hoping to accomplish um, to, to evaluate whether modeling tools can get some of these types of transitions correct or whether they would, might want to um, mix out the entire lower atmosphere with the presence of a cloud. And these are questions we're still working to answer and I don't have answers to right now, but um, these data support those types of analyses. Um, switching gears just a little bit, uh, a few years ago, there was a nice paper that Peter Sullivan and co-authors put together looking at the structure of stable boundary layers. And um, in that modeling study, it was found that there were these temperature fronts that came through the domain uh, where we had these random kind of mixed turbulent structures that um, kind of processed through in time. And so we were curious for the cases where we had these nice stable boundary layer conditions, whether um, we were able to see similar structures. And sure enough, on analysis, um, this is just an example from one of the flights that I showed you in the previous figure. You can see very clearly these well-mixed structures that are vecting through. And so currently, Brian Butterworth, who is a research scientist working with my team here at, at the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory, is digging into these cases in more detail to better understand what drives these structures and drives their evolution. And at first glimpse, it looks like there are strong connections to the presence of a low-level jet and um, the, the kind of shear layer that develops at the interface of that low-level jet. Um, I talked about aerosol properties earlier, and uh, we were, again, fortunate to be co-housed with our collaborators in the Chemical Sciences Laboratory at NOAA, and they had just been working to develop a small aerosol uh, optical spectrometer called the POPS, uh, and this is an instrument that we flew back in 2015 as part of Erasmus to get detailed profiles of the lower atmosphere. Um, this provides, this figure on the bottom left provides an example of those types of profiles and you can see the structure that exists uh, with a local maximum around 250 meters in this particular case. And we leverage these types of data uh, for our flying activities on the North Slope. Um, this sensor has since been picked up by um, the Department of Energy the ARM program, and they've been flying it on their tethered balloon system as well as on their other aircraft. And finally, I mentioned uh, retrievals, and these are some examples of how our electric data were used in that sense. So we have uh, this top figure showing the measured temperature structure of the atmosphere relative to retrievals from remote sensors, in this case, an airy system that was at the North Slope, um, where the colors are the same at the same altitude, the, the system was performing well, uh, where they're a little bit different. You can see there are issues like at the end here, for example, you can see that the system was reporting slightly warmer temperatures, or excuse me, colder temperatures than what was actually measured. 
And we've done similar analyses as model output in this case with a fully coupled uh, ice ocean atmosphere model that was running in, in a weather forecasting predictive capability. Through some of this early work, I also became entrained in a community that's known as ISARA. This is the International Society for Atmospheric Research Using Remotely Piloted Aircraft. I'm guessing some of you are familiar with this society already. Um, it's a fantastic group that is exclusively focused on using these types of platforms for atmospheric science. And uh, I was fortunate that in 2018, I was selected to be the science chair for this group. And we were able to bring the meeting, the annual meeting of the team to Boulder, and we brought about 150 of the best scientists in this area and engineers as well um, to the Boulder area, both to have a, a great you know, meeting and discussion, but equally importantly, the week following the, camp, uh, the meeting, we had uh, what we called a, a community activity, uh, a flight week, uh, which we termed lap rate, which is lower atmospheric profiling studies at elevation, a remotely piloted aircraft team experiment. And we took uh, aircraft that were operated by teams from a variety of U.S. institutions, including Virginia Tech, Oklahoma State, University of Oklahoma, uh, University of Nebraska, University of Colorado, of course, and Blackswood Technologies, out into the field. And um, we flew the wings off of these platforms. And I say that largely figuratively. There might have been one wing that actually came off at one point. But um, we, we flew over a thousand flight hours in about four and a half days, which was uh, a lot of flying to be taken out over that short amount of time. And we did this in the San Luis Valley of South Central Colorado. The map shows our flight locations on the different days and the imagery just shows kind of the scene down there. Um, and we flew with a few specific loosely organized objectives related to the AM boundary layer transition, um, aerosol properties in the valley, drainage flows and convective initiation. And so just a few examples of the sorts of things that we looked at uh, when it comes to drainage flows, there are some smaller valleys that feed in the San Luis Valley. Um, and we operated aircraft, uh, particularly the last day of sampling, we were very focused on that specific topic, um, looking at the kinematic and thermodynamic structure of the drainage flow so that we can test um, some of these kind of 1D and 2D models of what that flow might look like. This next slide shows some examples of the measurements that we collected during the campaign. Um, and I won't get into all of the details here because there's a lot going on, but generally it shows some nice perspectives on the sorts of analyses we can do. On the bottom left there, you have the theta V uh, evolution over time, uh, of course, with the drainage flow in place initially and then converting to a well-mixed lower atmosphere. Um, the bottom right shows some of the spatial information that we can collect with the platforms, not just in the vertical plane, but also horizontally. And so this vertical axis in these figures is actually the, the um, distance across the canyon to across the valley uh, in the Sawatch Valley, which is in the upper left here. You can see this narrower valley that extends into the San Luis Valley. And here you get to some of the details on how the, the horizontal structure of this uh, flow changes over time, as well as over the width of the valley. Uh, we also worked with our colleagues at NCAR with um, Anders Jensen and James Pinto to investigate how well these observations might be used to inform uh, forecasting or prediction activities. Um, specifically here, we looked at how integrating observations from the UAS might help to support improved prediction of the drainage flow. And so you can see on the left-hand side here at two different altitudes, 13 meters on the left column and 116 meters on the right column, the change in the uh, predicted flow probability uh, where we have, you know, with, without any sort of assimilation of either the surface observations or the UAS observations in the top panel, the UAS observations alone in the second panels, the surface observations alone in the third panels, and then the combined UAS and surface. And you can see a much higher probability of that drainage flow setting up in the simulations where the UAS observations were integrated. And that bears through in this right-hand comparison as well, where um, we have LIDAR data to compare to. And you can see that without bringing the UAS in, the, the model is not really able to set up any sort of um, stronger drainage flow in this area. Another thing that we did during lapse rate was uh, a lot of system intercomparison. And this was a primary objective where we 
had some surface-based instrumentation, including remote sensors and tower-mounted instruments that we can compare our UAS-based observations to. Um, this is all documented in a paper by Lindsay Barbieri from 2019, but um, it showed some interesting things. It showed, one, that the integration is really, really important. And I think we knew this, but this kind of is a nice way to document that even when we're using the same sensors, you know, the way that those sensors are integrated in the platforms becomes a critical component of how well that sensor performs. But it also showed that largely our systems were providing research grade measurements and were, were able to be used for this sort of um, atmospheric science that we were talking about here. Um, as a result of this, though, I, I got an idea and an ambition to try to develop a standalone sensor system that I called MiniFlux. And this is combining instrumentation to measure thermodynamic state of the atmosphere, winds, and turbulent fluxes um, from a package that's about 450 grams and you know a few inches by a few inches. Um, and the purpose of this or the idea behind it was that this sort of a payload could be then integrated onto a variety of different aircraft in roughly the same way um, and provide consistent observations. And a few examples of that being deployed to the field, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here because some of these aircraft are not small UAS. For example, the, the Sea Hunter, uh, which is a, a twin engine aircraft that we uh, deployed in Northern Alaska in collaboration with the University of Alaska Fairbanks as part of the stratified ocean dynamics of the Arctic campaign that ONR supported a couple of years ago. Um, you can see many flux installed under the nose of the aircraft here. And the purpose of this campaign was to collect detailed uh, measurements of the lower atmosphere um, between, you know, uh, maybe 500 feet and 6,000 feet uh, between the Alaskan coastline over the land fast ice and then out to the marginal ice zone a couple hundred nautical miles offshore. Uh, there were also surface-based assets in place for the campaign. You can see a few different um, measurement examples. In this case, one of the kind of complex um, temperature structures that we observed in this uh, Arctic environment and some of the response of, of, for example, our temperature sensors going to 50 Hertz here, we get very nice uh, response in a well-mixed environment. Um, lately, we've been working with NOAA, uh, and this is actually a small UAS platform that is designed to be able to take off and land vertically. So it's a hybrid aircraft that has a hexacopter or a quadcopter style of electric takeoff and then transitions to horizontal flight. And here we have mini flux under the wing. Um, the idea here being that we can deploy this aircraft from ships uh, in remote ocean environments. And it's, in my opinion, one of the only ways that we will regularly be able to get observations near the surface over remote ocean environments, just because there aren't many assets that can get out there and stay out there and are willing to do extensive sampling down, you know, between the surface and one kilometer, for example. Um, the bottom figures just show some examples of data from this particular set of flights that were conducted in the Arizona desert last spring. And uh, you can see a, a boundary layer transition sort of environment um, as the day evolves, a significant amount of turbulence building and, and variable wind conditions. The other thing that we did with the mini flux instrumentation is further one of our own platforms at the University of Colorado, uh, this platform being the Raven, which is pictured here. You can see that a lot of the components from the mini flux are now integrated into the Raven, distributed on the airframe a little bit, which is slightly counter to what the idea of mini flux was supposed to represent. But um, we did become aware of the fact that having one body wasn't always the most efficient way to do things. And so we were comfortable redistributing those sensors in a way that we could characterize them carefully and then deploy them for scientific um, reasons. Again, you can see there's a multi-hole probe on the nose to measure angle of attack and side slip. We have that fine wire array that I talked about on the data hawk as well. Um, we have up and downward looking IR sensors to give us information on the presence of clouds overhead or um, surface structure variability, you know, coastlines, um, ponds, et cetera. And then again, looking at pressure, temperature, and humidity sensors up on top of the body here. We have two Weisslar SS421s um, paired in an offsetting angle so that we don't have uh, hopefully solar effects on those. Um, as a quick aside, you see the little cartoon on the right here. This is something that was developed for a, a current campaign called Splash. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about Splash in a minute, but again, trying to connect to ways that we can uh, 
engage a variety of audiences, we, we decided to design superheroes around some of our instruments. And so Winged Wonder was born. Um, last spring, we took the Raven out to the Southern Great Plains facility in Oklahoma. Um, additionally, we flew at the NREL uh, Flatiron campus here in, in Boulder to do comparisons against tower mounted instrumentation. And so the plots on the left are time series of Raven wind speed and direction observations in the red uh, curves relative to those from both cup style anemometers and sonic anemometers that were mounted at the same altitude. You can see that generally things agree quite well between the two different platforms or between the Raven and the tower mounted instrumentation. Um, on the right is a slightly different type of comparison. Here we were doing repeated um, chasing of radiosons in the lower atmosphere at the SGP facility. We also compared to the tower there, but I'm just showing figures from the radioson comparison. So the radioson would be launched and we would profile up behind the radioson a few seconds afterward. And you can see uh, now comparisons for a variety of aircraft, the Raven being kind of the mustard yellow points, um, but we were also there with the Black Swift S2, the University of Oklahoma Copterson, the uh, University of Nebraska operated Meteo drone and another uh, M600 platform that the University of Nebraska brought along. So generally these platforms agree well with what was being measured by the radio sound uh, with some scatter around that one-to-one -one line. With that sort of characterization, we felt comfortable bringing this into um, a more of a research environment. And one of the recent campaigns that we participated in was the atomic campaign. Uh, this is the campaign in Barbados that I was referring to earlier, and the primary objectives for Atomic were really focused on understanding convective mass flux, uh, mesoscale organization, and depth of the shallow uh, fair weather cumulus clouds or trade wind cumulus clouds that develop in, in over the tropical Atlantic. They're very important from a climatic perspective because of their ability to both um, distribute, redistribute moisture and heat to the atmosphere, as well as uh, just their impact on the local surface or local planetary albedo uh, with the cloud cover, of course, being much brighter than the surface ocean, um, as well as understanding, you know, the structure of the boundary layer and how that evolves with cloud cover. And so our primary objective for Atomic, um, and this was actually a campaign that we deployed on very short notice for, because originally we were supposed to take the hybrid platform that I was talking about developing with NOAA and fly that off of the, Ron Brown, the Ronald Brown um, offshore. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the aircraft was not quite ready to go. And so with about a month and a half notice, we mobilized the University of Colorado team to get the Raven um, to operate in the nearshore environment. And so we were housed on the beach in um, Morgan Lewis here in the northeast corner of, of Barbados. Uh, all of our flight activities were in the nearshore environment extending you know, a couple of kilometers offshore and we did very regular um, type of flight patterns that we repeated twice a day, uh, almost every day that we were out there. Uh, overall, we got about 87, I think, flight hours out of this campaign over the course of about a month. And that profile looked a lot like what you see here represented by this one flight where we would conduct an initial profile up to a kilometer and then do extended legs at a variety of altitudes uh, the first one being right below cloud base, which is what you're seeing in the video there, and then stepping down to 400 meters, 200 meters, and 20 meters so that we can collect statistics at those altitudes uh, over time and be able to start to piece together flux profiles. So just some examples. Uh, this is a summary of the thermodynamic structure measurements that we made. Um, you can see the top half of this figure are the Raven data. And so the bottom is from ocean bound systems. Um, you can Feel free to ignore those, but this provides a, a nice complete picture of how the pieces fit together. And here you can see very nicely, um, you know, the sort of structure that we were observing associated with these types of, of cloudy conditions over the course of the month. Um, looking at detail, you know, you can see some of the scatter that occurs when we held altitude for a while. And so you do see some of this local variability. And one of the questions that we wanted to address is how that variability changed changes with height in the subcloud layer uh, under these types of uh, marine chemos clouds. And the figure on the right shows just an example of that sort of a, of a question uh, where we're looking at distributions of the temperature anomaly from the mean temperature 
at both 20 meters to right above the water surface as well as up at 500 meters. And, and um, this is something that we're planning to extend to, uh, of course, more than one flight. But um, this is one of the sorts of the examples of the type of information we we're hoping to pull out of these measurements. Um, similarly, we looked at vertical velocity structure. And so another example of looking at vertical velocity at 500 meters versus 200 meters, it both in clear conditions and then adding in um, the conditions where we had a cloud overhead. You can see the skewness of the distribution changes pretty dramatically with the cloud in place. Um, again, more to be done here, but some nice insight into the dynamics of the subcloud environment. Um, and then looking at stress near the surface as a function of the surface wind speed from the Raven from our flights at 20 meters above the surface. And this is work that's um, in prep for publication in a paper that's really looking at the momentum budget. One of the benefits of using the UAS, of course, is being able to get profiles. And so we're trying to piece together the uh, momentum flux profiles through the, through the subcloud layer here for different wind regimes, which is why we color coded by dates here. Shifting gears completely, another recent campaign that we were involved with was Mosaic. This is the multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate. And uh, this is a campaign that took place from September of 2019 to approximately October of 2020. Uh, for those not familiar with Mosaic, the, the research vessel Polar Stern was frozen into the sea ice here at 85 North and allowed to drift over the course of a year. The colors in the map here are different legs from the expedition, the blue being the first legs, one and two, the kind of salmon colors, leg three, the orange colors, leg four, and then the purple, leg five. Um, if you wonder about this discontinuity, it's because the ship got spit out of the ice pack here in the summer. And so they repositioned back near the North Pole for the last bit of leg five. And we were, our, our UAS team was specifically targeting a few different hypotheses um, that you can see on the right here, uh, specific to the complex structure of the Arctic boundary layer and the ability of models to represent that based on their, um, their own parameterizations and vertical uh, resolution. The impact of leads and the, on the transfer of energy into the atmosphere um, and how well, again, models are able to capture that sort of energy transfer. And then the subgrid scale variability that exists in the coupled Arctic system and this is as much focused on the surface as it is on the atmosphere. So our part of this mission took place on legs three and four. Um, legs did get shuffled around a little bit due to COVID, but you can see where we were flying. The green dots represent places that we flew the data hawk and the data hawk was flown from the ice surface in this case. And the red dots represent times where we were flying the Helix. I'll talk more about that platform in a second, but that's a multi-copter platform that was mainly uh, looking at radiative terms. And so you can see we operated as high as about 87 degrees north, uh, and as you'll see in a second, at fairly cold temperatures. So getting to the complex structure part of this question, this is, this is mosaic in a nutshell from the data hawk's perspective. Um, you can see we sampled a, a wide variety of thermodynamic conditions um, from very early on in the campaign, where we were operating at minus 30 or so, near the surface um, to late in the campaign in the summertime where you know all the temperatures are pegged near freezing at this in the summer because you have ice melt going on but what's going on aloft is a very different story and so we had a couple of these warm air intrusion events both in the summer as well as um, some happening I think it's in this cluster where you get some really strong and much warmer air strong inversions with much warmer air aloft um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at is how those types of um, events are impacting the surface energy budget and the formation of clouds, um, as well as aerosol particles. So there were some studies being done by Swiss teams looking at how aerosol concentrations were changing near the surface in these warm air intrusion and transport events. But again, a really wide variety of different types of conditions. You have cases where you have that well-mixed boundary layer all the way up to the cloud, uh, and other cases where you have elevated inversions and, and decoupled cloud layers. So a lot to dig into here. Um, I mentioned the leads. We did fly the data hawk to try to um, capture details on the impact of leads on atmospheric structure. And this is, um, this is something we're just getting into. So I don't have a ton of initial results to show here, but um, the types of leads we were sampling were relatively small. They were maybe a couple hundred meters across. And um, I think it's an important question 
uh, what what the impact of these types of leads might be because you know the ones that we see from the satellites are often quite large kilometers across and we know that there is significant energy transport uh, from the underlying surface into the atmosphere in those instances but I believe that these smaller leads are much more prevalent and much more frequently occurring and so um, there's a kind of scale and number issue to consider so the profiles on the right hand side show examples of flight data we separated the flight profiling uh, uh, between the upwind and downwind portions uh, relative to the lead, which is kind of the green points here. And um, as I said, we're just digging into this and starting to look at whether we can see any notable impact of a lead of the scale on the overlying atmosphere. So I mentioned the helix as well. Uh, here's another one of our cartoon characters, our superheroes, uh, also known as the buzz. Helix is a hexacopter that we developed and built up at the University of Colorado. Um, we worked with uh, collab collaborators at Kip and Zonin actually to develop kind of drone specific pyranometers in this case. These are uh, lighter weight versions of the PR1 um, that we put on up and downward looking gimbal systems so that we can keep them level in flight. And we did conduct early flights with a fixed wing platform that also carried pyranometers. In that case, it was the the Delta T SPN ones. Um, and we found the corrections that we needed to make uh, to be quite challenging. And even though we were doing everything correctly, uh, it was challenging to, to correct for any small tilt offsets of the sensors. And so we decided with the evolution of the technology and especially the battery technology to now leverage a multi-copter system, which is providing us with roughly the same endurance as the electric fixed wing that we were carrying these sensors with previously, which is about a half hour of time um, so that we can keep things a little bit more level in flight with these gimbals. We also had a multi-spectral camera, in this case, a MicroSense Red Edge, which has uh, four channels uh, uh, of, of visible image or, or imagery that we can put together to do feature characterization. And so here are some examples of the data collected by the Helix. Um, I mentioned the subgrid scale variability, thinking about the surface. You know, the Arctic ice surface is, is incredibly heterogeneous, and there's a lot going on just from the perspective of the development of ice ponds. Um, and then during the summer season, as these ice ponds are in place, you know, you can have drainage events where a bunch of the ice ponds will get so thin that they drain out, and then you're left again with the bright underlying surface beneath them. You can have refreezing events, you can have precipitation falling on thin ice, and so this sort of a scene that you see in the bottom can change from day to day depending on the weather conditions. And so we leverage this platform to conduct mapping operations like you see in the bottom left. This uh, albedo map there is, is associated with the image on the left hand side. Uh, and you can see, of course, the darker surfaces in the center associated with the melt ponds and the variability in albedo. These were collected at about 20 meters. And that altitude actually is quite important as is shown by the upper figure here. Um, one of the questions we were equally interested in was the impact of aggregation and, and scales on the albedo measurement that's made. And so this figure in the center shows the upwelling irradiance um, over two different surfaces, a melt pond for kind of the profiles that end on the left and then the snow the profiles that end on the right. And as you gain altitude, you can see that that upwelling irradiance changes pretty dramatically. Uh, uh, until you get to an altitude of about 40 or 50 meters where things aggregate to a common um, albedo value for the scales present here and for the field of view of the sensor. And so these questions are interesting from the perspective of putting previous measurements of surface albedo into context, as well as capturing at a much higher uh, resolution the, the horizontal variability when we fly at extremely low altitudes. And this shows some examples of that. Um, this work is being done by Radiance Palmer, who's a postdoctoral scientist working with us at the University of Colorado. And she's looking at feature identification to try to um, characterize the scale of different features over the length of the melt season. Uh, so specifically melt ponds, ice, bare ice surfaces, um, ocean, dark ocean surfaces and snow covered surfaces. Um, and she's also working to document the different types of albedos that were observed over the course of this time period. And so this is an example of one of those very low altitude flights where the aircraft was left to hover above features of interest. So this white ridge, for example, high albedo, of course, the melt pond has a much lower value, the ocean much lower still. Um, 
and then document the evolution of that over the different flights for different types of features. This is all very much work in progress. Um, we're happy to collaborate on this stuff with anyone who's interested, but we, we just got out of the data processing and, and um, publication phase for Mosaic, and now we're starting to dig into the science more. All right, very quickly, the last campaign I'll, I'll mention is one that we conducted this past spring. This was another instance where um, our team at the University of Colorado was uh, contacted by another PI who had NSF support and who was interested in getting a clearer picture of what was happening in the lower atmosphere as part of her research. And specifically, uh, this research, which is part of a campaign that was called Wisco Disco, is focused on the impact of near, near shore circulation, so lake breezes or land breezes, on ozone concentrations over coastal uh, Wisconsin, because you have high emission sources at the southern end of Lake Michigan and Gary and Chicago, and you get transport of pollutants out over Lake Michigan, and those are left to sit there in a very stable regime in the springtime where the lake water is still quite cold um, and, and mix, and, and the chemistry is definitely not my strong point, but uh, ultimately you get these circulation events where the lake breeze pushes a lot of that pollution inland on the coastal areas. And so our part of that with the Raven was to document the evolution of the lake breeze environment um, and the structure of that circulation over time while they were flying a multi-copter with ozone sensors to get profiles of the ozone concentrations uh, from the surface up to about 400 feet. And so the bottom figures show a few examples of those flights on the far left is, uh, it's a little bit of a twisted plot. So you have longitude on the, the x-axis. Um, the black line roughly represents the position of the lakeshore boundary. Um, and then time on the, the vertical axis. And so, you know, as we pro progress through the day here, you can see this marine boundary that exists in the nearshore environment, which gradually decays as we're making repeated passes uh, onshore and offshore. And this is actually the, the flight that I was showing you earlier, flying over the, the, the camera, flying over the Wisconsin shoreline was from this particular day. I'm um, looking at it in vertical space, you know, things look a little different. Again, you can see the early presence of that. Um, lake breeze circulation, which then is pushed offshore in this particular day and then comes back in the evening. Um, and then just from a vertical profile perspective, this is what things look like. You know, you have the nearshore environment kind of bouncing between that lake breeze and the, uh, the convective boundary layer from the, the coastline throughout the day. And you can see huge amounts of variability there in the temperature structure. Um, but it's really these types of events where you do have the lake breeze coming on shore that tend to push ozone uh, concentrations up to levels that are unhealthy for the population. So looking ahead a little bit, uh, we have some upcoming campaigns. Um, next summer, we're participating in the Tracer campaign. This is a Department of Energy funded project, and we're collaborating with our colleagues at the University of Oklahoma, who will be flying the copter sonic system. We'll be flying the Raven, and um, perhaps somewhat similar to the Wisco Disco campaign, our role is really to document the sea breeze and its interaction with the background um, convective boundary layer and try to understand the impact of that kind of enhanced lift uh, and, and the difference in the aerosol properties as well on the development of convection over the greater Houston area. And so we're gonna be flying the Raven in South Texas in the summertime uh, to conduct again, these long profiles across the sea breeze front, frontal zone and better document how um, turbulence and aerosol properties may help to enhance convection around that area. Um, I mentioned the superheroes. We've got an active project right now in the Crested Butte area called SPLASH. SPLASH is the study of precipitation in the lower atmosphere and surface for hydrometeorology. And this is focused on all things that help to drive water into the Colorado River. Uh, we have a bunch of surface-based sensors, radars, towers, um, surface flex stations, the, the OU clamp system is out there. But then we're also deploying some of our aerial assets uh, working with this, the University of Colorado IRIS program and Black Swift, who have a, a moisture, a soil moisture mapping system that we're going to deploy to this region as well. Um, we're working, collaborating with N, NREL and some other uh, collaborators to begin to develop Raven as a platform that can map out wakes associated with, with wind turbines and better understand how the presence of wind turbines will impact downstream uh, atmospheric state. 
Um, so that work is, is still early on, but we have started conducting some flight, flights on the NRL campus here in Boulder. Um, and we hope to participate in upcoming campaigns in Oklahoma that will target larger wind farms in that area. And then um, we're always looking to continue to innovate our sensing capabilities. And some examples here, um, we're, we're currently in the process of developing our own multi-hole pressure probe. Um, this is largely being undertaken by Steve Borenstein at the University of Colorado. Um, and we have a lot of interest in trying to automate some of the sampling. And so this is an example from a French team who have, they're way out ahead of us on this, but we hope to catch up someday um, where they have uh, technology in place to deploy these, these assets and have them make their own decisions in flight about how to best sample a convective plume, for example. Um, and this, I believe, is a uh, simulation-based version of this. But I saw this firsthand during Atomic, where they would send the aircraft out. It would fly its own flight pattern based on you know, its measurements that it was making, and then it would come back a couple hours later. It's really neat technology, and I think there's a lot that can be done in that area. All right, so I'll summarize quickly. Um, we're using small UAS to provide new perspectives on the lower atmosphere and its interactions with the surface. And we've deployed these assets around the world from the poles to the tropics um, to document kinematic and thermodynamic structure of the lower atmosphere and uh, help improve our understanding of lower atmospheric physics. Currently, we're working to understand the Arctic boundary layer, um, momentum transport and cumulus development in tropical trades, mountain meteorology as part of SPLASH, um, the potential impact of these types of observations on local scale numerical weather prediction. And I will say that as part of SPLASH, we've engaged the local weather forecast office in Grand Junction, and they're very excited about the possibility for gaining insight from small UAS. Um, additionally, we're looking at how, how local scale um, circulations may impact weather and air quality, uh, looking at surface properties and trying to work with, uh, with NCAR to better understand how we might be able to assimilate measurements of those surface properties in high resolution simulations. Um, I mentioned the wind energy work and then of course, continuing to advance our technology. And I, I want to end by saying that there are a ton of opportunities out there. Um, we are definitely actively looking for additional collaborators um, who see potential benefits to integrating UAS into ongoing earth system research. And so, um, you know, if any of this looked interesting to you, I strongly encourage you to reach out and um, maybe start a conversation about how some of these, these assets might be deployed to answer questions you have on the lower atmosphere. And that is what I have for today. I do have references up. Um, they are in the presentation and I'm gonna put them here so that when the presentation later is recorded and people go back to it, you can see this for a few minutes, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it on the summary for the time being as we transition to questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Heiss, for, uh, for the beautiful images and um, movies of the UAS measurement system and the clever applications uh, through the various campaigns. Um, we do have time for questions. Again, the Slido interface is below the presentation screen. And we do have a few questions, and I'm going to uh, present them in the order in which they have been submitted. And that would be um, Andrew Kay uh, asked the first question, and he asks, how are wind observations from the UAS delineated from the actual motion of the UAS and the turbulence that it causes? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so um, in short, it's done the same way that it's done for large research aircraft and uses the same types of equations where we have uh, an inertial motion or measurement unit on board and that measures all of the motions of the aircraft. Um, and the, the wind, um, the winds aren't directly measured. They're actually derived um, using the information from the multi-hole pressure probe, which is telling you how the aircraft is moving relative to the airflow around it. Um, the GPS on board, which is giving you the aircraft velocity over the ground, and then the um, IMU, which is telling you about the pitch roll and yaw of the aircraft. And so the, that's how the winds are actually calculated. The, the question about the turbulence that the aircraft causes is a different one. And we've been working to try to document that with um, both uh, simulations. So looking at really high resolution simulations of flow around our platform and trying to understand you know, what sort of disturbances it may cause in different sampling regimes, as well as in a wind tunnel 
And um, that's definitely ongoing work, but um, we're, we're trying to extend that probe, which would be impacted by any sort of uh, turbulence or flow around the airframe out ahead of any impacts that, that the aircraft might cause. Hopefully that answers the question, Andrew, but if not, I'm happy to provide more insight. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, James Pinto, your, your collaborator and colleague asks a question. Um, he asks, can you comment a bit more about uncertainties in measurements obtained with UAS? Yeah, um, sure. I think this is one of the more challenging things to um, accurately calculate. We, we know kind of what our sensor uncertainties are reported to be, um, but as I mentioned with respect to the lapse rate campaign, a lot of the actual uncertainties with the measurements come down to how their sensors are integrated onto the platform. And so we, we've been working, as I mentioned earlier, to do side-by-side -side comparisons with um, trusted systems that people have, have documented to better understand um, how well we, we do measure things with the platforms that we're deploying. Um, I know from the perspective of data assimilation, uh, the uncertainties are, are important. And so I, I think it's something that we should work on collaboratively and bet, you know, move towards the best ways to document all this um, following published techniques in the literature, as well as taking into account some of the specific considerations for these small platforms. Thank you, James, for that question. Uh, we have um, another question from another colleague and collaborator, Terry Hoke here at EOL. Um, Heist, thanks for a great presentation. What do you see as the future for multiple UAS flying simultaneously, like a swarm, a network, to create the concept of a vertical moving tower from both a science need and from a practical implementation of the technology and logistics? Thanks. Yeah, Terry, thanks. That's a really good question. I think there is a lot of promise for this. And I think that um, you know, we, we've certainly operated multiple aircraft at once. I wouldn't call it a swarm. It's usually two. I think maybe at the most it's three. But um, I do see opportunities to increase those numbers. And I think um, doing that, some of that comes down to what's practical given the current guidelines and regulations that the FAA has, right? So at the, at the moment, uh, things are set up in a way that for each aircraft, we need a separate pilot and separate observer. And um, if you start to put 10 or 12 aircraft up at once, that becomes a lot of people, which negates a lot of the cost savings and other benefits that UAS offer. But um, I think we can move in that direction. And I think that um, from a scientific perspective, having the ability to capture simultaneous observations uh, at different altitudes or over different environments. And, and I'll bring up the example of the Lake Michigan study. Again, we already know that the next time we go back there, we're bringing more than one aircraft because ideally we want to be able to profile simultaneously both onshore and offshore instead of transitioning between the two all the time and then we can get kind of isolated um, information over the different surface types and in kind of the marine side and the continental boundary layer side so i think there's a lot of promise for multiple aircraft operations and um, we, we have to keep moving in that direction and demonstrating to the faa and others that we can do that safely and um, that there's benefit to doing that Great question. Thanks, Terry. Um, we have a question from Ned Patton here at M Cubed, um, and he asks, perhaps I missed it, but have you characterized the mini flux observed momentum fluxes as they relate to that observed by other instrumentation, i.e. either the sonics at Marshall or the LIDAR at the San Luis Valley, or similarly with um, other instrumentation during atomic or mosaic? Yeah, thank you, Ned. That's a very good question as well. So I didn't present on that. Um, I have done some comparisons, uh, not for the momentum fluxes, but for sensible heat fluxes that we calculated from the Raven relative to, um, trying to remember whether it was the SGP tower or the uh, NREL tower, I can't remember. But we have done some comparisons between those. They generally compare well. Um, it's I, I haven't published any of that, so it's it's still in progress. But But yes, it is on our screen to, to move that forward and document how well we recreate those measurements from the aircraft. Thank you, Ned. I think we have one final question 
And this is a question from Matthias, Matthias Steiner, who is our Director of Aviation Applications Program at RAU. And he says, thank you for a stimulating presentation. It is great to see how far you have come using these platforms to collect atmospheric data in challenging environments. Have you thought of how to deploy UAS platforms in urban landscapes to collect data about wind, turbulence, air quality, or heat island? Yeah, that's also a really good question. I have thought about um, these platforms to measure a lot of the things that you mentioned here. Um, specifically, the heat island and air quality come to mind as kind of critical um, observational needs in urban environments. And, um, I, you know, I, I'll be honest and say I've been very busy with the other campaigns and haven't um, dug deeply into how to best do this. But part of me is actually hoping that um, it will be done for me. And I don't say that from the perspective of being lazy, but I say that from the perspective of um, kind of the, the air mobility side that's taking off and the, the particular urban air mobility, which are, you know, delivery platforms, um, air, air taxis, things like this that are starting, you know, people are looking into this as, as viable means for um, uh, conducting business in the future. And that, that ranges from Amazon to, to pizza delivery to, to people delivery. So if you have these platforms operating in urban landscapes, um, you no longer have to worry about how to best deploy them. They're already there. And it's just a matter of instrumenting them correctly. And that was actually part of the motivation for Miniflux. Um, although Miniflux is likely too large for that specific application, um, but was to develop a common package that could be put out there to collect data from platforms of opportunity that are flying already. Great final question. I, I see potential area of collaboration there, um, Heiss. <laughs> of course, yeah. Well, I see we are past uh, the seminar hour. If you are interested in Dr. Heis de Boer's presentation and have further questions, please reach out to him via his email, which is provided on the seminar flyer. On behalf of EOL and RAL, I would like to thank Dr. de Boer on his excellent and attractive presentation on UASs. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.